Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Shrikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. We are well into the 10th week uh, of our lectures on nonlinear adaptive control. And uh, we are now in the process of learning about not just design of adaptive loss for uncertain parameters, but also robust adaptive loss, which um, are not impacted uh, because of disturbances that appear in the system due to, you know, unmodeled uh, dynamics or, you know, external reasons uh, that may impact a dynamical system, such as what you see in the background. Right. So, uh, what we were doing in this previous session is uh, we had sort of started to look at uh, the stability and adaptation design uh, or update law design for this uh, projection based adaptive controller. Um, and the idea was that the framework was based on. Uh, filtering the closed loop signals, right? So we actually filtered the known closed loop signals first. And they were, of course, uh, the important thing to remember was that uh, these were all identical filters, right? That is identical um, you know, gains. And we then, of course, computed the dynamics in this filtered variables. This was another very critical step, right? Um, and then we figured out that uh, you know, this dynamics has an additional exponential decay term, which we ignore in standard stability analysis. This is pretty common. You can also keep it and continue your analysis, but then those terms are anyway going to go to zero. So it doesn't matter. We'll essentially, we end up with a lot of exponential decay terms, which you don't care about. Yeah. Uh, so we don't carry it any further anyway. Yeah. So we sort of ignore this one. So we have a dynamics in the filtered variables, which looks very much like the dynamics uh, the original system dynamics and this is what is rather key yeah um, and we choose a vf in terms of this what we call a hat which is in fact the projected version of phi. yeah so we actually have a phi hat plus delta hat here and so this results in a hat always lying between a min and a max right and these are the bounds that are already given to us right these are bounds on the parameter that are given to us um, and this a hat is what appears in the control law vf, right? And so, therefore, the control law remains bounded. So, if the f and then we also, of course, had a short discussion, and I mentioned that if the control law vf is the filtered control is bounded, then v is also bounded because vf dot is bounded and beta vf is bounded. All right. So this is again uh, something rather important. This is what is the robustness aspect. And even in the presence of disturbance, uh, we are not worried. Yeah? Nothing changes here. All right. So uh, then if we look at this, uh, we, we started looking at the filtered closed loop, of course. We had the EF dynamics written in terms of the new parameter error Z. Yeah. Again, a new uh, sort of um, expression instead of A tilde because we are using a non-certainty equivalence paradigm. Yeah. So we had an EF dot dynamics and we had a Z dot dynamics corresponding to the parameter error, if you know. All right. And the important uh, step or the interesting thing to remember was that the, there were two terms, phi hat and delta hat, that had to be uh, sort of uh, defined. Yeah. And delta hat was, more, was just a directly an expression, not a dynamical system. And it was motivated by the certainty equivalence adaptive law. And after that, phi hat is chosen just by computing a z dot and cancelling terms that can be cancelled in the z dot using a phi hat dot. So there was no Lyapunov analysis in order to compute a z dot. So this is again another interesting, uh, you know, perspective in non-certainty equivalence where your update law for phi hat is not computed 
using a Lyapunov function. Right. So once we have cancelled whatever we could, we get a nice z dot law. All right. And uh, then we sort of wanted to start the stability analysis. And in order to do so, we of course needed a candidate Lyapunov function, which has a rather interesting looking expression right here, not your usual Lyapunov function. The important thing to see is that this is non-negative, right? And how we sort of claim that was by trying to find a minima for this function. Uh, and since the EF and the Z terms are decoupled, we could deal with them separately. It's evident that this is anyway a non-negative term. In order to prove that this is a non-negative term, we took a partial with respect to Z, that is we tried to find the minima and then equate it to zero. Uh, when we took a partial of with respect to Z, the first thing we realized was that the partial looks very much like the z dot expression right it contains a large piece of the z dot expression and this is deliberately done of course because this will help us in the analysis subsequently um, and so essentially what we do is we took the partial with respect to z in order to find a minima or maxima we equate this to zero and so it's evident that the minima is at z equal to zero well it's evident that the optima is at the z equal to zero and we claim that it's a minima we leave it to the audience to figure out why it's a minima and not a maxima yeah and if we substitute z equal to zero in this expression we found that the second term goes to zero so what we are left with is a non-negative term all right so that's sort of nice I mean, that's sort of nice yeah so so this is uh, essentially uh, what we are trying to uh, say that this v is you know sort of uh, has a nice uh, lower bound yeah, which is critical for us yeah so again uh, let me so at z so I, this is again something i want to verify and stress on so at z equal to zero we have a minima and that minima turns out to be lambda over to two log cos hyperbolic of uh, phi star and the expression for the cos hyperbolic um, is something like this right the expression for cos hyperbolic is something like this and you can see that uh, essentially the cos hyperbolic is uh, so if we write the expression out let's see so this is I believe this will be lo lambda by 2 log of e to the power phi star plus e to the power minus phi star divided by 2. Yeah, this is the expression. Um, so I'm wondering if this can turn out to be negative also. Um, I'm wondering if this can turn out to be negative too. Um, it may be possible. It's not impossible for this to be negative too. Uh, but the important thing to remember. So I, I don't want to say that this is necessarily. Uh, you know, I don't want to say this part that is necessarily positive semi definite. Um, I believe this is certainly lower bounded. I believe this is certainly lower bounded. So this is what I wanted to verify uh, that you have tan hyperbolic Z plus phi star is equal to tan hyperbolic phi star here. Yeah, for the minima. And let's see if this becomes greater than equal to zero or not um so this is what i wanted to verify a little bit more carefully today uh, so so tan hyperbolic z plus phi star is equal to tan hyperbolic phi star and because the tan hyperbolic function looks something like this yeah it looks something like this now um, the only time uh, the two will match 
is I believe when z is exactly equal to zero. Yeah, is I believe when z is exactly equal to zero. Exactly. So that's the only time they will match. Only time they will match. Uh, however, uh, when z is zero, this term is of course gone. And then I have this term. I have this term, which is going to give me lambda over 2 log posh phi star. Right, right, log posh of phi star. And that's what will be, will give me a bound. Okay, so this is what will be the expression. Okay, so let's not worry about, a, it's not exactly zero, I believe, not necessarily zero. Yeah, so this is not necessarily zero, but, but this is essentially the lower bound that you will get. Yeah, this is essentially a constant lower bound that you will get. Okay, um, I don't think we have to worry too much about what that exact value is because for my Bavlat's lemma type analysis, all I need is a lower bound. Okay, um, great. So this is where we, this is where we were. So I will start here on lecture 10.5. So now all I do is take careful derivatives. So uh, I take an EF, EF dot, which is this guy. And then I take the derivative of this guy, which is lambda by two partial with respect to Z, which is this times a z dot yeah and now if you substitute z dot z dot has exactly this term in the negative right with a mu xf squared right so that's what you get you get a uh, z dot term here so this uh, so this there is already a mu here uh, so the z dot sorry z dot also contains a mu here yeah so the mu xf squared and so what you will have is a mu lambda by 2 uh, tan hyperbolic phi star minus tan hyperbolic z plus phi star uh, times xf squared and this is also squared here and there's a square here okay okay I, I believe i believe this square is on this whole term and the square is on this whole term this is fine okay so now you see i have nice negative terms yeah, negative definite term minus k e f squares minus k e f square, and I also have a square term here in x f times tan hyperbolic phi star minus tan hyperbolic z plus phi star. Right. So I'm I'm going to call this term as omega. In fact, this whole term is omega. That's what we do here. Right. And so you have minus k e f square minus lambda by two mu cap omega square. Right. And then this term can be written using our sum of squares as mu by 2 times EF squared with an R, some gain R. Yeah, I can use, uh, you know, I, I'm what I'm using here is that um, AB is less than equal to, uh, well, I'm actually doing this, AB is equal to uh, like a, square root r a times a times 1 over square root r b so this is less than or equal to half r a squared plus b squared by r yeah that's what is being used here if you notice from here so the mu remains as it is and from these two terms i get r e f square plus 1 by r omega square right so then once we do this, you get this, you know, uh, k minus mu times r e f square and mu times uh, lambda by 2 minus 1 by r omega square. So you get this term, right? And therefore you get v dot negative semi definite if lambda is greater than 2 over r, right? A and of course, k greater than mu times r. Now, one might ask why did we uh, one of the important questions to ask is why did we need uh, the lambda right why did we choose put the lambda here uh, remember one thing okay even though we get this nice term this is not a negative definite uh, v dot okay remember right because v was a function of ef and z and it's not very clear that this term is negative definite in z okay because there is an xf also right 
तो नेगेटिव डेफिनेट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू जेड इज नॉट वेरी क्लियर हियर तो दिस इज एट बेस्ट नेगेटिव सेमी डेफिनेट ओनली नाउ बिकॉज इट्स नेगेटिव सेमी डेफिनेट एंड आई वुड लाइक दिस टू सॉर्ट ऑफ डोमिनेट सम अदर टर्म या सो आई हैव टू मेक श्योर दैट दिस टर्म इज स्मॉलर देन दिस टर्म right and so i take an arbitrary lambda i don't know the value of lambda right i took some lambda positive anyway this lambda does not enter anywhere in the control law so it's not like we need to know the value of lambda is just for the purpose of analysis so this lambda now uh, has a 1 by r right so i can choose r large if i choose r to be big this is a small term and i have dominated this with some whatever lambda and correspondingly i have you know i have this r here so you no know, k can be large you know if i choose a large enough k i am done okay so that's so so if r is small sorry if r is large then k is large yeah, and lambda needs to be small okay vice versa i mean if you don't want to really care about choosing uh, large k you don't know how large the k should be yeah you can choose any k arbitrary k okay then r has to be really small so if r is really small then any k will work and you choose any k correspondingly there is a small enough r for which this will be positive right and once this is positive this becomes very large so then lambda has to be very large right but we don't care this lambda doesn't appear in the control law right so lambda being large doesn't change anything for us it's just for the purpose of analysis so this is a rather neat trick yeah in analysis when you don't know how big this gain is you know and you don't want to push the control gain k large because k actually appears in the control law right so k is i mean k is not here uh, in in you know in vf right k is not in vf but if you remember uh, k is there in the control law right because we have to implement a u and v contains k right so k being arbitrarily large is not uh, a good idea Right, so if you choose a any small positive k, there is always one can always say that there exists an R such that k minus mu R is positive, and if the R is small, then all you need to do is have a large lambda in the analysis. But again, it's just for the analysis, so it doesn't change anything for us. So we are more than happy. All right, excellent. So that is the purpose. So what we have now is we have a v dot, which is v of course, which is lower bounded. and we have a v dot which contains these two quadratic terms so it should be sort of obvious to you for all of those who have done uh, babelat's lemma and signal chasing analysis several times that uh, you know you you can prove that ef and omega go to zero as t goes to infinity so this is something you can always prove from this kind of a lyapunov like analysis all right we are not claiming that v is positive definite and lower bounded at zero and all that but we know it has a lower bound it is non increasing yeah so we can prove all the quadratic terms that appear here are going to go to zero using babelat's lemma signal chasing and that's what we do like right here right we can also show that ef dot goes to zero not difficult right we have done this before too once we prove ef goes to zero we can prove ef dot goes to zero and if ef dot and ef both go to zero what do we know we know from our filter construction that uh, you have ef dot equals minus beta ef plus e which implies e is ef dot plus beta ef yeah so if so both ef and beta ef dot go to zero means e goes to zero right and that's what we have the other additional thing we sort of get which we don't get in certainty equivalence remember we never get a term in parameter error in certainty equivalence right but here we do have a term in parameter error it's a very non linear term so not very obvious what this term means or what it looks like physically but we at least have some kind of a term which goes to zero right we know that this guy goes to zero and this is a sort of an attractive set for the uh you know parameter error the important thing to remember is that um if you start with zero parameter error that is when z is zero suppose z is zero then this quantity is zero so omega is zero 
if you start with zero parameter error you will stay with zero parameter error because look at this i mean in the absence of disturbance and errors etc of course because if you look at this term this is zero as is zero z equal to zero is an equilibrium right so therefore this right hand side becomes zero now this is not true in certainty equivalence right in certainty equivalence this would have been your update law so even if you started with a tilde zero the right hand side has no a tilde in it so it doesn't matter if you started with a zero a tilde you will still change the parameter value which is of course seems unhealthy but well that's the sort of solutions we have in this setup if you started with zero parameter error in this case z being zero then the right hand side is zero and you do not move from it okay so it sort of creates an attractive set in fact attractive and invariant set okay creates an attractive and invariant set right so if you stay in that set uh, you will remain if you start in that set attractive plus invariant set for the parameter errors. if you start in this set you will remain in this set and you will be attracted towards this set also okay so this is a rather interesting property yeah uh, which actually improves the adaptation behavior for this system all right excellent so i hope that was clear and you understand that now of course we didn't go into any further details now right so but but remember that uh, in order to compute the actual control law you have to compute v which is equal to vf dot plus beta vf right and we already have shown that vf is going to be bounded and right? vf is going to be bounded because all closed loop signals are bounded right and if vf is bounded then vf dot is also going to be bounded i mean that also can be proven we are not proving it um, so i would actually say Proof boundedness. Yeah, I would leave it to you as an exercise to prove boundedness of this. Once you have the boundedness for VF dot and VF also, then you know that V is going to remain bounded and so is U. Yeah, and this is not going to be affected in the presence of disturbance. Again, we have not done any analysis with disturbance. Notice there is no disturbance analysis here. But what is happening here is the fact that the parameter, the design is not going to change in the presence of disturbance, right? Only the Lyapunov analysis changes. So basically, you will start getting, you know, some terms in, uh, you know, some terms corresponding to the disturbance here. That is what will happen, right? This will happen, right? And uh, so again, I mean, if I if I was to sort of do this, there'll be a f of t some function of disturbance appearing here everywhere everywhere so all these steps remain the same but then i'll have something like this but the good thing is uh, because i have negative definite terms in both ef and omega uh, so nothing changes really i will still get like a residual set in the ef which will of course move to a residual set in the original states and all that mess yeah and um, and of course my parameters remain bounded so my control remains bounded my control will never become unbounded it's it's irrelevant what happens yeah the control is never going to become unbounded neither is the parameter estimate yeah so the disturbance um, uh, may affect how the residual set i mean instead of going to zero errors right so you know instead of going to zero errors you may not go to zero errors but it doesn't really i mean you'll get a residual set as you expect but you don't uh, change anything in your uh, parameter boundedness nor in your uh, control boundedness all right so that is the sort of important thing to remember okay so this is the projection method by the way this is only one kind of projection method that i have specified there are other ways to do parameter projection in fact this is a rather unusual way the more common way is using the notion of convex sets which i am not uh, presenting right here uh, but it is available in you know i mean in, in results from ianu etc yeah so you have references which talk about you know convex sets and how to do projection on convex sets yeah 
I'm not going to I'm not going into that right now because you know for the sake of time we have to restrict our material yeah uh, but this is a pretty solid pretty good way of doing parameter projection yeah and parameter projection as you can see is critical in adaptive control okay? now one of the concerns that uh, some of you might have is that um, projection requires uh, knowledge of your uh, bounds on the parameter right? without parameter bounds there is no way you can do projection and if you remember in the beginning of adaptive control we did not assume any kind of bounds on the parameter right so uh, what happens if you don't have parameter bounds available to you and you still want to uh, impart robustness to the adaptive control right? so these were uh, so this discussion began, of course, uh, when we had that, you know, um, you know, the fighter jet crash, right? And results came about in a few years after that. And the first one of them was first, whatever, first seminal result was by Ionu and Kokotovich in 1983. And this is called, this was called a sigma modification in adaptive control. So I will sort of uh, classify this as in the absence of parameter bounds okay in the absence of parameter bounds so the question is what happens if you don't have parameter bounds and you still want to impart some kind of robustness to your adaptive control right uh, so we start as usual with the same system and this is called the sigma modification in adaptive control by ionu and kokotovich uh, we start with the same system x dot is ax plus u plus g and we know that there is a bound on the dis disturbance right i mean we don't know the value of the disturbance at each instant in time but of course we do have knowledge of a bound very reasonable assumption right if anything you can just keep a very large bound just to be conservative but we do know a bound on most disturbances right uh, for example if i'm flying a drone i have a pretty fair idea of how uh, how much the wind velocities will be yeah i mean i have a pretty good idea of the range right of what the wind velocities would be um if i'm again if i'm flying a satellite and uh, you know i i have actuator issues i don't know how well the actuators perform if they precisely produce the amount of torque that i expect them to i may not know the exact values but i will still know how far off they can be yeah, and so that's essentially what's the job of a good engineer right to have a pretty good range in which your system will operate so so what is the objective the objective is as usual to try to drive the error between x and some bounded trajectory xm to zero right so as usual what do we do we create the error dynamics and we have this certainty equivalence adaptation law so we are back to the certainty equivalence adaptation law so the idea is when you do a you know if you do a certainty equivalence adaptation law you will take a v which is something like one half e squared plus one over two gamma a tilde squared pretty standard where a tilde is a minus a hat and if you do the v dot and compute everything and try to find the a hat dot you will see that a hat dot is gamma times e times x where gamma positive is the adaptation gain all right so what uh, ionu and kokotovich proposed was the sigma modification which meant that you add a damping sigma a hat term so this adaptive law right so the whole problem was that the a hat dot update law never contained a term in a hat or a tilde of course it can't contain a term in a tilde because that's not implementable so you know and kokotovich is the next best thing they added a nice negative term in a hat all right and then of course we they did some analysis to show what happens and this analysis is what we will see in the subsequent session all right excellent so what we looked at today is the sort of completion of proof of our parameter projection based adaptive control law 
uh, we had a rather interesting Lyapunov candidate and we took its derivative. Uh, we also had a sort of lambda coefficient on this in this Lyapunov candidate. Uh, which we saw was very useful for analysis and played no role in the control. So it did not matter how large we took it. And we also realized that this um, non-certainty equivalence type paradigm in projection gave us a um, sort of attractive and invariant set, which has nice properties such as if you start with zero parameter error, you remain at zero parameter error in the absence of disturbance. Uh, so these were the kind of properties that were absent in uh, the certainty equivalence adaptive point, right? And uh, finally, we sort of started to look at the sigma modification in adaptive control, which would be a way of imparting robustness uh, if you did not have uh, you know, knowledge of upper and lower bounds of your parameter. Excellent. So we'll continue with our discussion on sigma modifications uh, in the subsequent session. So I invite you to attend. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you.